video. I'm buttoning. Go ahead. Well, good morning. I'm excited to talk with you today uh, about the workforce of 2030. So what our team was tasked to do was to tell you what your workforce is going to look like in 2030. And so I can do that real quickly based on current trends. First, we're going to continue to have untapped technology at the work face. And Mr. Khan talked about revolutions that are happening. Uh, great, exciting talk. Uh, that's not happening at our job sites now. There's going to be more prefabrication in current trends, most of which is going to come from overseas. The workers are going to be multi-skilled, and it's going to be task-based. But it's going to be different than what we think of multi-skilling as we've talked about it in the past. Uh, they're going to be trained in different things, but the reasons why they're doing that may surprise you. The workforce is not necessarily going to be smaller than what's currently on the job site, at least from a productivity standpoint. The workforce is going to be less mobile, and it's going to be older. Mr. Khan touched on that this morning when he talked about walking around and looking at the attendees of the conference. So what we're going to talk about today, this is what the trend says for the construction craft workforce of 2030. If we don't like that trend, what can we do to change it? So we're going to talk here in a little bit about some things that we've seen, and I want to make sure that like good CII research, this is backed up by strong academic uh, rigorous scientific analysis. We collected our own data as part of this survey. We have more than 2,700 survey responses from craft professionals. But we are also using secondary data sources from um, areas such as the Bureau of Labor Statistics, from NCCER, um, from the National Science Foundation, from the CDC. We have millions of data points that is backing up what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so you can have the confidence in what you're hearing. Now, today we're going to look at this, the workforce of 2030, along three different areas. We're going to start with technology, which is often a focus uh, when we look at our workforce challenges. Then we're going to talk about the skills of the workforce. And then finally, uh, what we feel is a critical piece, and that is the culture of our workforce. Uh, Mr. Khan talked about that this morning. So with technology within the construction industry, uh, I've been involved in a number of different efforts that have looked at workforce shortages, and the solution that gets brought up quite a bit is technology. Technology is going to help us. If we look at venture capitalist investments within the construction industry, okay. If we go back a couple years, it was about $8 billion investment. That's a significant amount of money. If we move forward a few years and look back just uh, between 2014 and 2019, it's $25 billion in venture capitalist investments in construction technology. That's a significant amount of money. It outpaces all other industries. This workforce shortage is driving us to look at this. Okay? So it would be wise for us as an industry to ask ourselves, what have we bought with this money? What has this purchased for us? What value has it added? Well, one example that I can give you, with our research team, we were very interested in frontline supervision. You know, that is the... Uh, right at the work face, um, you know, implementing the policies that come down in management, helping the project get done. And our research team felt like we put a lot on our frontline supervision now. Okay? So we asked them, what do you spend your time doing? And this is the response that we got from over 1,400 frontline craft within our industry. So 37% of their time in a given day they reported as spent supervising crafts. So hold on to that number in your mind for a moment. 
So with a data set of this size, we can start analyzing this different ways and think back to our technology question. What if we look at supervisors that are very experienced, that have been doing this for 20 years, and compare them to supervisors that have less experience? Does this change their time allocation? What if we look at it in terms of their project management competencies? Have they been trained in the use of critical path method or advanced work packaging? Does that impact what time our craft supervisors spend doing each day? We could also look at their, tech, their competency with technology. Are they certified in using BIM? Uh, are they certified in other different systems? Or do they report having competency or experience in that? And when we look at this data and we divide it up along these different factors and others, what do you think happens? Well, I'll tell you what happens. There is no difference in what these technologies and what our supervisors are doing, okay? These numbers change very little based upon training, experience, and competency, okay? Why do we care about that? Well, let's hold on to that 37% number, okay? If we look at some previous work that CII did a few years ago as part of RT330, this was the chart that they came up with that said this is the optimal amount of time that craft supervisors should spend at the work face, 60%. We are nowhere near that. This is critical to us now as we struggle with the challenge of not only getting the workers, the craft professionals, onto our job sites, but we also struggle with their experience level and their skill level. So we need that frontline supervisor there to help them um, do their job efficiently and effectively. So this is one example of many that I can give you where this technological investment, this venture capital, is not impacting our industry. So why is that the case? Well, Mr. Khan touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, I see many of you in here active on your mobile phone as I'm up here talking. Well, if we look at something like our iPhone, uh, we saw the chart earlier today that talked about how powerful of a computer that is. You know, NASA wishes in the 60s when they were going to the moon that they had the computing power that is available on our phone, okay? And it certainly is very capable, but I would, I would argue that the reason that thing is so successful, why it has, uh, you know, changed the world, is because it is really easy to use. Your five-year-old can use it. Your 80-year-old can use it. It's very intuitive, and so the, the, the focus of this technology investment needs to be on the human interface with that technology, how we interact with them, okay? So if we look at who funds research within the United States, well, one of the big organizations that funds research all over is the National Science Foundation out of the federal government. Uh, they're one of the largest funders of, of engineering and science research. They have their 10 big ideas, and one of their big ones is this future of work at the human and technology interface. And this graph shows you what they're working on right now. And so this is stuff that we would expect to come out in the next few years. So artificial intelligence, robotics, we hear that a lot. Our industry has talked about construction robots coming to save us for 40 or 50 years, okay? Um, they're largely not here yet, and they're not gonna be here um, in, in 2030, at least how we typically think about them. So if we start to think about how could technology affect our workforce? Well, as Mr. Kahn pointed out this morning, we need to start thinking differently. Over on your left, uh, we see a, a structural member there, okay? And we think about how we design projects, how we design to execute our projects. Well, the box down there shows color-coded um, uh, color pieces to assemble this structural system. They're preformed. You don't have to measure. You don't have to cut. They're color-coded so that they're very quickly and easy to put together. Okay? That's a way to set up to improve our efficiency. That's an example of something. It doesn't seem, um, it doesn't seem big. Okay, but that would be a huge improvement on our job sites. 
Artificial intelligence. We don't see, based on the work that we've done, craft professionals using artificial intelligence as they do their job. Okay? Now, they may be getting information from it. Most of what seems to be focused in this area right now is going to be on the engineering and management side of things. Okay? So how can we use AI to improve those processes so that what we send to the field makes life easier for the people there that are executing the work, okay? not making it harder? And along those lines, the idea of robotics, it's probably better for us to think about human-assisted robotics. Um, not robots operating independently, that's extremely challenging in the current time. But we're going to see here in a moment how our workforce is aging. If we have robotics that can help provide energy to that workforce that is knowledgeable and skilled, perhaps that's a way that we see improvement. So I would challenge you when we start to think about technologies. Okay? We saw a list of technologies up there. There's some exciting things. I would challenge you and your company as you're looking in the next 10 years, don't just go to the newest shiny thing. What is going to be available to us that's going to help our supervisors be at the work face getting the work done and not sitting in a job site trailer trying to get the latest piece of technology that's not working to work? When we think about working differently, there's a number of different technological processes over the last few years that we've seen at the work face that have made um, uh, impact in how we go to do about work. If you think about the, the quick connections instead of welding, um, you know, that's driven by a labor shortage. One of the big ones that was reported in our work is the use of battery-powered hand tools that you don't have to have cords running all over a project. That's a, that's a, not only is that a safety hazard, it slows you down because you're having to drag the cord around versus put a battery in at the start of your shift work with it all day, it produces great power, you plug it in at night, and it's ready for you the next morning. That's a, that makes the lives of a worker so much easier. Okay? And then focusing on that human technology interface and how we are using it. So that iPhone that we talked about earlier, or the smartphone, that all of you in here in this room have, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many of you allow craft professionals on your job site to have access to that smartphone? Or do they have to leave it in the truck? They can't bring it in because we don't want pictures taken. There's good reasons for that, but understand, as we're recruiting people, particularly younger people, that's a strange thing to adjust with. Okay? So hold on to this idea about technology, and we're going to revisit here in a few minutes. And Dr. Paul Goodrum is going to talk with you about the skill set of our workforce. Thank you, Tim. So how will the change in dynamics of our craft professional workforce change between now and 2030? To answer that question, we have examined how changes in multi-skilling has been occurring in the industry. Now, what is multi-skilling? Multi-skilling was an industry labor strategy that was first introduced in the late 1990s. The intent of the labor strategy was to somehow utilize a smaller workforce, but a workforce that was more skilled, certified in more than one trade. What you're going to hear today is that that was the intent, that was the plan, but the actuality is a little bit different. And so for this team, we look, we look at both how is it changing, but also, I think, more importantly, what is the motivation for craft professionals to become, uh, become multi-skilled. So to examine as crafts are, change, are becoming more multi-skilled, we examined data from the National Center for Construction Education and Research. We examined, studied over 600,000 individual certification exam results. And using that data set, we were able to track each individual's performance on certification, not just identify when they passed their first exam, but when they passed their second exam in another trade. And by that definition, we recognize them as multi-skilling. Now, one limitation is data set, large data set, longitudinal, that was awesome, but it just looked at the written aspects of certification. Any of you who are involved in workforce development understand that for an individual to be truly certified means to not just pass the written exams, but also be able to pass the performance exams. Regardless, it's still one of the biggest data sets ever to look at multi-skill in the United States. 
And what we found is that in the first year of the data, 2005, we saw in this population, 1% was multi-skilled. By the last year of the data, 2020, almost a little bit over 9% had become multi-skilled. At this rate of change, by 2030, we're estimating based on this population that the multi-skilled workforce to number anywhere between around roughly 11% to 16%. So we're seeing significant growth along a broad industry spectrum. But we also want to see, is that change consistent across different demographic groups? So we looked at the change in multi-skilling by race, in this case. And what we found specifically is between whites and Hispanics, both were seeing an increase in multi-skilling. But we saw it flip. Between 2005 and 2012, white craft professionals in this data set had a higher frequency of being multi-skilled. 2012 beyond, Hispanics in this data set became the most frequently multi-skilled workforce, and Hispanics still represent the strongest growing demographic in the United States construction industry. Next, we look at the changes by gender. And certainly one of the biggest challenges we have in the United States is not just to attract more females into the craft professional workforce, but to more importantly, retain them. And what we found is that between males and females in this data set, both were seeing an increase in multi-skilling, but by and large, males were increasing at a faster rate, and in each year, we're having a higher frequency of multi-skilling. So by and large, what we found in this part of analysis, multi-skilling is increasing. But in my opinion, that just tells a very small part of the story. It's really the more interesting aspect is understanding the motivation and, and how multi-skilling, while it was planned to deal with a smaller workforce, it's actually, we're seeing something quite differently on that. And to tell you that part of the story, it's my pleasure to turn it over to my good friend and colleague, Daniel Groves. So to answer this question of why the workforce is becoming more multi-skilled, we looked at some data. And we were able to do a direct comparison of data from back in 2000 to 2020. And one of the interesting things that we saw is back in 2000, the primary reason for this willingness to become multi-skilled was to increase earning capacity. And of course, as you see on the right-hand side there, this uh, learning a new trade is hand in glove with that capacity to become multi-skilled and to increase earning. 20 years later, earning a, a better income is still important, but it's not as high now as employment stability. Employment stability is now higher, and that's become so much more critical. And it's really not surprising when you consider the fact that this is after the Great Recession. The 2020 data is during COVID, uh, at least part of it. And so there's some real uncertainty at this point in time within the industry among craft workers of will I continue to be employed and what's my future going to look like? I think another key thing here that really resonates as it relates to this idea of employment certainty is around the fact that our industry has, I believe, too much treated the workforce as a commodity. And certainly they're of high value, but we have to be investing in them. And Ian Kahn talked about this this morning when he said, if we don't invest in the workforce, and maybe he was talking more about those in the office, maybe he was talking about those as it relates to technology, but I would say it's across the spectrum of the workforce all the way to the craft worker. We have to be investing in. They have to realize that they, and believe that they have value, not just to get today's project done, which of course there's high value for, but they need to understand we value them in the future. And on future projects, we wanna make sure that they're there and they're available. So one of the things that we're seeing is this multi-skilling is beginning to replace mobility. And of course, mobility, as you know, is pretty critical in our industry particularly in areas where there's a heavy reliance on the craft worker. Think of areas like the Gulf Coast. Uh, and maybe there's a strategy here that we should consider employing as it relates to even doing even more uh, prefabrication and modularization. I think there's a real opportunity here for our industry if we were to seize it. So we know what's driving multi-skilling. Uh, now let's take a look at what is decreasing workforce mobility. Well, this is, there's a significant change that's been happening in the construction industry among households across the U.S., and that is the rise of dual-income households. 
And so we're seeing this pretty, uh, pretty significantly. In the 1970s, only about 30% of construction households were dual income. Fast forward about 40 years, that's now over 80%. And that's underscored even further by the decrease in spousal unemployment. So this is pretty significant, and the challenge really is pretty simple. If you're a craft worker in a dual income household, you are considerably less likely and, and less flexible in terms of either moving or traveling. Now you're depending on two incomes. So this really, in many ways, helps explain uh, why this workforce has become less mobile. And multi-skilling, as I already mentioned, is beginning to replace, uh, is continually, consistently replacing mobility. What's really interesting, I think, about this is the organic nature of multi-skilling. There doesn't appear to be any, at least not that I'm aware of, there doesn't appear to be any grand strategy around multi-skilling. There don't appear to be any um, company strategies or tactics uh, within our industry for doing this, although certainly some companies are seeing the opportunity and pursuing that. But for the most part, we're not seeing that happening. It's simply the craft worker's response to the realities of their own household. And of course, that capacity to earn is still pretty significant. Not as high as employment certainty, but now you have dual incomes, and so just picking up and moving is not nearly as easy as it once was. So what can we take away from this? Well, I think one of the key things is simply we need to wrestle with the question of do we want a multi-skilled workforce? And maybe that's an irrelevant question because the truth is, is multi-skilling is increasing, mobility is decreasing, and so maybe the question is, is we ought to ask, is this how we want it to, to evolve? What is our industry doing and what should we be doing in order to uh, be part of this? And, and maybe even, should I say, extract value from it? I think that's a key question that we have to be asking. The next key takeaway I think that we have to, that we have to wrestle with is the fact that what's happening is organic. There's no real strategy here, but I think our industry has a real opportunity and I think we have to ask ourselves the question, what is our response going to be? Will we be part of this change or will it happen to us? I think one of the things we've seen in our industry too often is that change happens and we're often not part of it. We're not in front of it. We're not helping influence it. We're not helping direct it in a way that ensures better project outcomes in a healthier industry. And that's what we really want to promote here today. So I don't want to just present a challenge without also presenting a solution. And so I just want to point us back to a couple of research projects that CII led uh, and Kurt was part of as well. And then there were owners and contractors, of course, across this room and in uh, other conferences that may not be here today and that were part of. Some really good research that was done, and, and by the way, this is a perfect example of what uh, Stephen Mulvin and Greg Sizemore talked about earlier, where we are turning research into something usable in the industry. The first one I would just point out is RT231. This was talking about the value of craft training. The recommendation was quite simply that our industry should be investing a minimum of 1% of the labor portion of every project budget into workforce development and training. And as was stated earlier this morning, if you're making that kind of investment in your workforce, it has a significant return on investment. Higher productivity, less absenteeism, less turnover, safe, uh, higher safety and or, um, higher rates of safety. That's, those are the kinds of things that we want and there's a whole lot more that can be addressed there as well, but really encouraging that investment is so important. And then the second thing is a research project that was just completed a few years ago, and that was RT-335. And RT-335 recommended seven policy areas that we need to implement. And they range from what we need to do in terms of how we change education funding in order to attract more folks into the trades and make sure that they are prepared. But the other uh, key component of it was this investment that was talked about in RT-231. So there's a consistent theme here of where owners and contractors really need to be coming together in order to make a significant difference and ensuring we have the right workforce 
at the right time and in the right place. And there was one question that was asked of Ian Kahn, and we ran out of time to, to ask it. And so I, I thought this would be a good time to put that in. And there was somebody asked a question about what is the right attribute of a change leader? And, and I would say the answer to that, at least from my perspective, is really pretty simple. It's just taking the next step. Taking a step and, and just going forward. As Greg Sizemore would say, it's the knowing is in the going. Just taking a step forward and doing these things that we've already researched and we've already recommended and we've already agreed are the right things to do. The workforce is evolving and we need to be part of it. And to talk about the, work, uh, the evolving workforce just a little bit more, let me invite Will Sutherland at this point. Thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> so what we're gonna talk about now is workforce culture. And when, you think, when I think about RT370 and the workforce of 2030, I think of it as a three-legged stool. You had Dr. Taylor that talked about technology, you had Dr. Goodrum that talked about multi-skilling, and then the third leg of that stool would be your workforce culture. To understand the workforce culture, we, we compared the results from a series of questions between our RT370 data set and the general social survey. The GSS has collected from US adults related to their life experiences, attitudes, and behaviors since 1972. We used several of their questions in our workforce study to understand what the workforce climate is and to understand how the questions relate to the construction industry versus the general industry within the United States. The questions focused around these five areas, respect, productivity, professionalism, derogatory comments, and reliable coworkers. When we looked at this on the two slides, the negative is showing you how the, the construction industry answered the questions more negatively than the general industry as a whole. And as we can see, derogatory comments was a very large negative driver for the construction industry when it came to the workforce questionnaire, 36% of construction workers answered the question that it was a more negative than it had been. And what this really reinforces the stereotypes that we have within our industry. And as you can see, this is almost a, a generational issue as well. Uh, when we look at this, Today, the younger generations are less likely to accept derogatory comments. And what this can do is this can drive attrition within our industry. We may be able to recruit a younger generation, but if we don't change the culture of our workforce, they're not gonna stay around. What's alarming though, is when we get to the female perspective of the, of the workforce culture. As you can see, we have a serious problem on our hands. Whether it's derogatory comments, treated unprofessionally, respect, they don't consider anything positive when it comes to construction industry. And that's alarming, and that should be alarming to every leader in this room. The things that we have to do is we have to change this culture. Diversity inclusion is a big part of everyone's company in this, in this room. I'm sure most of you, if you work in a home office or the, the, your main office, diversity and inclusion is something that's a part of every aspect of your day-to-day -day business. We have to make that out into the workspace as well. Because we can clearly see that we're not doing well on our work, work sites. And when we're looking at recruiting over 50% of a population and we don't have a diverse and inclusive workforce or work base for them, they're not going to stick around and they're not going to come to the job site. Then we look at construction versus age, the culture versus the age. And as I said before, this kind of opens up the generational issue that we're talking about. The younger a person is on the left, as you can see, they're much more 
likely to report a negative experience. As the older workers out there, they're less likely to report that. What's interesting about that is, you know, 15, 20 years ago, if you had a bad day at work, you may go down to the bar and, and have a drink with a friend or two and, and talk about what's going on, right? But it was a small circle of people. The generation today is much, much different. Today, if someone has a bad day at work, with social media and social outlets, they can go home and, you know, post an innocuous comment about, God, I had an awful day at work today. This is what happened. And instead of two or three people seeing it, a hundred, maybe a thousand people see how bad a day this new to the construction industry worker had at their job site. Understand the impact that that has in trying to recruit those hundred, a thousand people that they, that they just bare, briefly touched. And this leads to construction aging faster as well. In 1994, the average age of a construction worker in the industry was 37 years old. In 2014, the average age of a construction worker was 41. And in 2020, the average age of a construction worker was 43 years old. Now, with our data and our projections for 2030, we're looking at the average age of a construction worker being 46 years old. Now, in general, that's actually younger than general, general uh, labor in the United States. However, construction industry, as you all have been involved in your whole lives, uh, is not the least physically demanding. And we're really needing to have a younger workforce at our job sites. And that really leads to a mental health issue that we're having. This is a startling and, and not an easy thing to talk about, but it's something that we all need to get comfortable discussing, thinking about, and training. Construction fatalities are five, four to five times higher than they are for construction fatalities. Suicide rates four to five times higher than construction fatalities. Now, we've done an amazing job with job site safety. Every leader in this room has changed the culture of construction with your job site safety. We used to go to a job site years and years ago, and if we saw something a little unsafe, we didn't give it much thought. Today, we empower every employee, no matter the, the first day on the job, and no matter how small they believe that that safety infraction is, we empower them to report that. We don't have that same mentality when it comes to mental health. And we have to make a shift in how we're thinking about mental health. To put this in perspective, the suicide rate in construction industry is twice as much as it is with veterans in the United States. We all talk about veteran suicide rates. It's a big, it's a big push and as it should be a huge push. But we have to start thinking about the people that are at our work sites, and we have to really think about what we can do about it. This information is just coming in, though. And from here on out, we have to really start believing and thinking about how we fix this problem. We don't have the answers from this data set yet. But what we have is the ability to leave this room and start talking about it and start training about it. So some workforce culture takeaways, culture has to improve, or culture has improved in some areas. You know, you have to understand, this is a short presentation. We have a lot of data embedded into this. There are a lot of positives in the data set. We wanted to point out the negatives to show you where we really need to focus our attention. So there are positives out there. And one thing about the culture being improved is everyone in this room understands what needs to change. And I, I would put this seed in, in your thought process, especially when we talk about derogatory comments and we talk about women's negative experience on the job sites. I'm a father of two daughters. Anybody in here that is a, a parent or has a sister or anybody in the workforce, 
how are you going to transition the workforce to your daughters or to your sisters in the workforce? How are you going to do it? How are you going to make this workforce inclusive for them? How are you going to put your legacy out there for them? Support positive cultural change. We have to ensure that industry health. As I said, think about when you're interacting today, when you're interacting in the office, when you're inter interacting out in the field, how do you support a, a positive cultural change when it comes to being inclusive about different generations, about women, and all diversity within our workforce? You don't have an option in this. Ian talked a little bit about this. The future is here. This, all this data is showing us that we have to act now, and that's what's important. And finally, we have to destigmatize mental health on the job site. Whatever it takes, it's difficult conversations, I understand, and you don't have to be an expert. Don't think that because you're not an expert, you can't say something to somebody. That's not the case. If you see somebody out there, you see something unusual in somebody's behavior, say, hey, how's it going today, Jane? You know, is everything okay? Is everything, you know, can I do anything for you? Is there anything I can do for you? Support that. Destigmatize mental health. I'm going to give it back to Tim. Thank you. Thank you. So we've hit on what I want you to think about is three legs of a stool. Sometimes we think about technology as the solution to our workforce problem. There's opportunities there, but if these other two legs are faulty, then technology is not going to save us. Okay? So thinking about that human technology interface, thinking about how decreased mobility is going to change your project, change how you design your project. If your project's in the middle of Houston and you've got the greater Houston metropolitan area to draw workers from, maybe that mobility is not an issue. If your job's located in the middle of nowhere, without a population base in there, you may need to change and look at what you're going to do. And what Will talked about is something that we've talked about in this industry for many years, and Will was right in pointing out, those graphs should terrify us. Before everything that's happened in the last two years happened, our age trend was going down. Young people are not coming into this industry, and whatever you may think about, the current social disruptions that are going on with our country. As somebody who teaches young people every day as part of the job, they care about that stuff very much. And so if you don't, they're not going to come work for you. So this looming age cliff. But let's not just have a storm cloud up here. Let's think about to the earlier presentation, the great resignation. Let's say that you've bought into this idea that you know, office work and professional setting and knowledge workers, that's what you have to do to be successful and you're working in a crushing office environment and you look out your window and you see folks building, building something to improve the community. Maybe we don't need to think about the great resignation as us losing people. Maybe we need to think about it as us gaining people out of other industries coming back to, uh, uh, as Mr. Khan talked about, one of the oldest professions in the world. So we can use those opportunities. He put up there the challenges here, the UN challenges. We often don't think about this. I've been worked with workforce development for many years now, and when we, when we go talk to people, when we go talk to high school kids and their parents, the number one thing we talk about to them is salary. You can make good money. You won't have college debt. All of that is true, but that's not what they're really interested in. They want to make their community a better place. We've been making our community a better place for 1.75 million years, okay? That's us. We need to reclaim that and draw people in to help us accomplish that and be proactive with that instead of reactive. So a few things to leave with, a few takeaways. First, how is technology going to change our work environment? If it's not going to change our work environment significantly, if it's not going to make life easier, Thank you. if it is the smart toilet, I would say probably move on and find something else that is going to work. Okay? Don't just gravitate to the next new shiny thing. Look at how we are going to change how we work. Next, how are we going to design our projects 
when our workers are multi-skilled. As, as Daniel pointed out, it's not the workers in this room, it's not the people in this room that are deciding that multi-skilling is gonna happen. It's happening organically. How are we gonna leverage that to deliver uh, the products and services that our clients need and require? And then finally, with all the cultural challenges uh, that, are, that are out there that we've talked about on our job site culture, um, We've talked about these for many years. We've made some progress, okay? There's much work to be done. One takeaway, that this is something that you can take from this conference, you can Google it, you can go back to your company, and you can implement it in very short order. Who in here, raise your hand, has heard of CPR training, okay? Many of you probably require, as part of some of your safety certifications, the folks on your work environments to have it. Um, does that train you to be a medical doctor? If you're CPR certified, can you perform open heart surgery? I hope you don't do it on me if I ever need it, <laughs> okay? You're right there at the work face, something happens to somebody, and you're able to respond and get them set up so that we can get them to a condition to save their lives. Think about QPR, okay? Question, persuade, refer. It's modeled after CPR, and this is related to suicide prevention. Um, this is some training. As Will mentioned, it's hard to talk about this stuff, okay? It's uncomfortable to talk about this stuff, but not talking about it is not going to make it go away. The common misperception is if somebody's having these thoughts that you shouldn't talk to them about it. Research has shown that the opposite is true, okay? So get your people equipped, okay? so that they are ready to have those conversations. It's short training, it's shorter than, than even CPR. We do it on college campuses. We're starting to see some industry organizations do it. I know that I've received email, uh, emails from the Iron Workers Union. Uh, they're starting to do this training uh, with their folks. Uh, so I would encourage you to, to, that's a concrete action that you can take as you leave here today. The other action I'll leave you with is Daniel mentioned uh, RT-335 which talked about restoring the dignity of work. Okay? If you Google restoring the dignity of work, it'll come up with the advocacy document for that that was developed to help drive the change that we need in the industry, to give you the tools that you need, not only to give you the solutions, but the data that's gonna back up the lobbying effort that you're gonna have. If you don't wanna see it uh, on, on Google, you can walk next door to the event area and pick up a copy of the advocacy document at the NCCER booth. They would be happy to give you one. I really appreciate your time and attention today. Uh, as we saw earlier this morning, this is the biggest challenge that's facing our industry. And at this point, we'll have a few moments for questions. Yes, uh, great, thank you guys. Let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> So at the beginning of this, as we were transitioning from the break, the video didn't show, and so I know we have a short amount of time for questions, but I just want to take a moment to make sure each of these guys get recognition. At the end is Paul Goodrum with Colorado State University, Tim Taylor with the University of Kentucky, uh, Will Sutherland with the Williams Companies, of course I'm Daniel Groves with Construction Users Roundtable, and so I wanted to make sure these guys got recognized since uh, that intro didn't happen. But I also wanted to introduce one other individual. He's not with us today. Our, our thoughts and prayers are with him. He has a compelling reason for not being here. And that's Eddie Clayton. He was the chair of this group. I think he's done an outstanding job in guiding this. But it isn't just Eddie. It isn't just the four of us up here on the stage. But there were a lot of others involved in this process, from students uh, at the universities to other contractors and and uh, union involvement, uh, owner involvement, and so this work that was done is really outstanding. We've only shown you a thimbleful of it, as Greg would say, uh, and so we encourage you to take a look at more of it. We are out of time, but I wanna just take a moment for one question that came in, and there are, there are a million of them here. Uh, great questions, thank you all. Um, but let me just address this one. I'm grateful that you helped shed light on both our industry struggle with suicide as well as job site uh, equity as it relates to women in construction. What can my company do to begin addressing these challenges? And Will, that sounds like you might be the right person to answer that question. Start talking about it. It's not, it's not complex. 
It really isn't. It's, it's something that we don't talk about. It's a very difficult uh, conversation. I understand that, but uh, it's really just starting the conversation. When we were talking about safety 20, 30 years ago, people would laugh at you when you talked about, you know, watch out for that extension cord on the ground, right? We have to shift from that to today, everyone's reporting safety issues. The same thing about mental health. You start talking about it on your job sites, it organically grows within the industry and everyone begins to be a little bit more educated about it and it can look at some of the, the key indicators. Start talking about it. Yeah, great, thank you, Will. And, and let me say, I think that that goes along with everything we've been saying, whether it's dealing with the, a very important issue like that or new technology or disruption in the industry, it's about leadership. It's about stepping forward one step at a time and doing the next right thing. And I think that in many ways sums up uh, the actions that we need to take. So thank you guys again. Let's give them another round of applause. Thank you, thank you guys. And then if you would, uh, for our next presentation, please turn your attention to the screens for the introduction video.